celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. As, as Tyler was speaking, I can't help but think because we just love God and we love people. I can't help to think while we're praising him here of all my pastor friends who love the Lord and people around this parish who are reaching out and their churches were full, are full too right now this morning. And then our pastor friends in Africa and in India, I just believe, and I say this every year because God says it, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So since his kingdom, the kingdom of God, came from heaven to earth in Christ Jesus, that kingdom has been spreading and growing for 2,000 years. So around the world, I like to say the church, the body of Christ, not specifically this church, but us together with the whole body around the world are setting a new world record today with the body of believers coming to worship Christ. Why is that? Why are there so many people around the world who recognize the importance of Easter Sunday and God stirs their heart and even if you might have missed for a while, you desire to be in his house and worship him for his resurrection. Why is that? Well, praise God. It's because of what he did for us. Jesus, the word of God, God's word in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were made through Him, through the Word. So the Word made everything. And then John says it in his gospel. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad the Spirit gave us four different accounts of eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus. Because each one has a little different take. But to get the full picture, we need to read them all and see the whole thing. Amen? And in John's gospel, we see that Matthew was, uh, you know, he was trying to reach out to his fellow Hebrews, the Israelites. So he was using a lot of Old Testament prophecy in showing that Jesus fulfilled them all exactly on the day they were supposed to be fulfilled. So, so Matthew was proven to his Jewish brothers that Jesus was the Savior and the risen Lord. You know, Mark... He, he wasn't. He wasn't reaching to the Jews. He was reaching to the Gentiles. So he didn't use Jewish references. He didn't use Old Testament scriptures. Mark just laid it out and wrote about Jesus's miracles. There's a miracle or a healing on every page of Mark. He's proven to the world that he's, he's Lord because of all the things he did. And then Luke, I like to assign Luke to our new folks coming in to our center and stuff because Luke lays it out in chronological order. He was a doctor, an analytical thinker. He wrote it in chronological order. So you read the Gospel of Luke and you get it in order. But man, how I love John. John didn't care about all of that. He's just the most spiritual one. He just comes out in the beginning. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Hallelujah. He says the Word became flesh in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. So John is saying right from the opening that Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen? He's just letting it know Jesus is the living Word of God and be, He became a man. Church, don't we got to recognize, don't you see, He was our substitute. We could not fulfill the law and become right or righteous with God because of our sin nature. So Jesus comes born of a virgin, without the nature of Adam, but the nature of God. And the same devil that tempted the first Adam in the garden, tempted the last Adam in the wilderness. The first Adam fell in the sin nature was passed down. Every problem, church, every problem you see in the world, the government corruption, Sickness, disease, divorce, struggle, hatred, war, everything you see. We can't blame God. We recognize God gave dominion to man and mankind with his sinful nature was in charge with actually Satan leading him. But Jesus comes, born of a virgin. Hallelujah. He was one of us because he was born of Mary, but he wasn't the son of the first Adam. He was the son of God and he didn't have the nature of sin. Hallelujah. So that same Satan 
that came to Adam in the garden comes to Jesus in the wilderness. And this Jesus, the second, praise the second Adam who comes, the word of God who was God in the flesh, he crushed Satan and he won the victory for you and I. But church, he says this in John, right away at the beginning, he says, if any believes in me, he gives you the right to become children, not born of a human decision, not born of your father's will, not born of the race or the line from Adam, but if you believe in what he did, he died and rose for the world, for the sin of the world, and we know we need him, and we receive that. If any receive, he gives you the right to become children born again, born from above, born like him, born with a new nature, born without a sin nature, born with the nature of your father, God, you become born again in Christ, like Christ. It's almost too good to be true. So when we're born again, he has taken your sin nature he has taken the nature of sin that compelled us to sin, no matter how many religions we join, no matter how hard we try. He took out, he circumcised. In the Old Testament was a type. Everything that happened in the Old Testament was only a type and shadow of the true spiritual meaning coming in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, everyone who entered into the covenant of Abraham, there was a sign of the covenant and the sign was circumcision. They circumcised the flesh, but that wasn't the real thing. That was only a type and a shadow of the true spiritual meaning that was to come. When we believe in Christ, we are born into the family of God. And now the sign, he circumcises not your flesh, he circumcises your heart and he takes out your sin nature and he puts it upon himself, and he who knew no sin, he becomes sin for us. And the wrath of God, the wrath of God from the law, the penalty for sin, it does fall. But I praise the Lord, church, it doesn't fall on me or you. It falls on him as our substitute. Praise the Lord. Jesus took the sin of the world. The punishment fell on him. Now we who believe in him, we're born again of a new nature. I like to tell folks we've kind of taken this and, and we, hey, I've preached it so long. I tell you, I believe it. Do you know I'm not really from the, from the earth? I'm not really from the line of my fathers. I was in the flesh, but I died to myself. I recognize I was a sinner. I might have tried to suppress my sin through religious ways. I might have tried to become more holy or do better or be a better boy. But nothing could fix the problem because the problem is not sin. The problem is the nature of sin inside of us. So God sends Jesus to fix the problem once and for all. And when I recognized I needed him, I bowed my heart to him and said, Jesus, save me from myself. I need what you have done. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I can no longer be my Lord. Look where that has taken me. I need you to be, I need to follow you. You created the world. I did not. Why follow my plan? I'm a man. You're the creator. I need to follow your plan. I bow my heart and I want to follow you forever. When he knew I was sincere at that, he cut out my, he took all my sins, but more importantly, he cut out the nature of sin. You see, the gospel, the good news is even better than you think. It's even better than we think. We think he just took the punishment for my sin. And each time I sin, I got to go back and beg for forgiveness for him to take my punishment again. No, he took the punishment of sin once and for all. And those who believe in him, he gives you a new nature inside of you. I'm telling you, you've received Christ as your Lord, sir.
You're not a sinner. You're not an alcoholic. You're not a drug addict. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. And at this church, in so many spirit-led churches who understand this truth of new covenant grace are teaching around the world, praise God, we don't teach us people who have come to Christ about how bad their sin is. Listen to me, because I'm inviting you back. We teach people about how good God is who lives in them. We teach people about the righteousness of Christ that has now been joined with you, your new born again of spirit, and that's who you really are. And when you start believing who you are in Christ, what is in you will begin to come out of you and how you live and think. Isn't that amazing? See, God's ways are higher than man's ways. We wanted to bring man's secular ways into our religion and say, man, I've got to do better. I've got to try harder. I've got to push through. I've got to repent of this one and that one. Lord, change. And we're always carrying a load that we cannot bear. But Jesus took the whole load and gives you a new nature. <laughs> Hallelujah. So why today, why on Easter Sunday around the world, our church is full all over. Why is God breaking through governments that have suppressed Christianity in China and Pakistan and India and in Middle East and all these places? Why are they shaking and breaking and the gospel is shining and going out? Why all this? Because this Jesus that I tell you who died for the sin of the world didn't stay in that grave. Hallelujah. He rose from the dead. And then he gives us who believe in him, he gives us his resurrected life in us. Church, I'm not waiting till I grow older and die to begin my resurrected life. I consider myself, as Paul taught us, I reckon myself to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. I reckon myself as we were baptized to be buried with him and already risen from the grave. And I am living my eternal life now. I have this treasure in this earthen vessel. Yes, but the real me, hallelujah. I tell folks it's like a peanut, you know, the real nuts on the inside. Look at me. I'm telling you the real nuts on the inside. Hello? This outward body is just a shell. You know, I'm going to step out of it in glory and get a new one. But I've already begun that eternal life. It's so good, man. Come on, who wants some? I want to give it to you. Come on, I'm speaking this. Have some. I got a kingdom eternal life from heaven brought down from earth to earth by Jesus Christ. And now the kingdom life lives in me. Here, have some. I'm speaking to you the words of life. The words I speak are spirit in life. I'm not trying to convince your head. I'm speaking the power of God of the gospel to your spirit right, ma right now. And if you believe it, you can receive it. Have some right now. Go ahead. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's amazing. He that believes in me, out of his belly, his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's why the name of this church is the river of life. This river of life, the spirit of God, the life of God is flowing out of us and flowing to people all around here, the state, and the world. It's amazing. We're a part of something much bigger than just a local body. We're a part of the kingdom of God. We're connected as I'm preaching and sitting and, we're, and raising my hands and praying. I see our believers all over the world. We're a part of something eternal, something that's amazing. That's why it's so Important. I'm so glad that you came. Hallelujah. So why? You know, this is, think about this. Of all the problems of mankind, we hear about on the news. All your problems locally, you know, and you look at things and sometimes we dwell on all these problems. Let me tell you something. 
When you're in Christ, he tells us, be anxious for nothing. You don't have to be anxious or worried about anything when you're in Christ. But he tells us, it's, let's, let's put that one on the screen. Philippians 4, do not be anxious for anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He invites us. Look what he's saying. So what he did for us, do not be anxious about anything. Church, if you're here and you're struggling with anxiety, problems, worry, fear, doubt, shame, guilt, let me tell you something. This new life in Christ, because what Christ did on this cross and he became my sin and took it all away, hallelujah, it has now given me and anyone who believes peace with God. He has reconciled me, sinful man, to holy God by removing the sin out of the way that we can be right with holy God. So in God now, I have peace. I have the peace of Christ, the peace of God a peace that surpasses understanding of the world. Doesn't matter what I hear on the news. It doesn't matter what local shakings come to your home, your family, your job, anything. When you're rooted and grounded in the kingdom of God, you can have the peace of heaven in earth in your life now. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to earth. And now he tells us who believe the kingdom is within you. I recognize daily, daily, and I want you to as well, if you're a believer, that the kingdom of God is in you. You have peace with God. He's not shunning you or pushing you away. He's not, he's not counting your sins against you. He's not punishing you for your sins. The punishment fell on Christ. He's a loving father. He will teach us and correct us, but he's not judging or punishing us. He's teaching us. Hallelujah. And praise God, you can have that peace. He says this, keep it on the screen for a little bit longer. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything, saints, for after what he's did. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But you've come from different places. We've got a full house here. We've got lots of guests. Are you going through something? Is your family going through something? There's struggle, trial in your heart and your mind. Let me tell you something. If you're in Christ Jesus, you can have the peace I'm talking about for that situation right now, even as I'm speaking. Don't be anxious about anything. How can this be, God? How can you say that? Well, I'm going to tell you. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, I'm going I'm to take it to him. Every situation I'm taking to him. Why? He's the one that created the world and he invites us to take it to him. I used to struggle with that. I've been to Africa, I've been to India. I said, Lord God, how can I pray over this little situation in my life? It seems so small and what I've seen, what people are going through. He says, because I care about all of your needs too. I'm a big God and I can handle each, each one of you. You can't think and say, well, I don't wanna ask for me. I don't want to ask for me because, you know, there's other people with bigger problems. God's a big God and he cares about everything you're going through. Every thought you have, he cares about you and he can meet your need while he's meeting everybody else's too. But he wants us to go to him in faith. He wants us to recognize what Christ did. The mediator between holy God and sinful man that have a right relationship with him and he wants us to acknowledge that you're right with him and that you can go to him anytime and ask with thanksgiving so I don't wait till he answers the prayer to give thanksgiving I give him thanksgiving while I'm praying before I see the answer do you see that don't be anxious but by prayer and petition, he wants us to petition him. Go to him, but go to him with thanksgiving already, believing that he's God and he loves you enough to care. Hallelujah. Present your request to God. 
So hallelujah. I believe some of you are doing that right now. You're hearing the word of the Lord. Open your heart, present your request right now. Go ahead. This is church. This is what we do. We're meeting together as a body. We can talk to God. He's here. God, God is here right now. He's in me. He's speaking to you. He's in our worship. He's in our midst. He's with you. You're gathered in his name. He's here. So ask and then go on to the next verse seven. Then he gives an answer here. You do this. Believe he'll take it. Believe he can solve your problem better than you can fix it. Anybody ever tried to push through and solve their own problem in a way that makes it worse? He's your loving father. He wants you to take a step back and give it to him and trust him. Amen. He says, you do this, give it to me, and I'll do something right away for you. And the peace of God, which transcends, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You've been worried, you've been fretting, you've been concerned, you've been struggling, arguing, fighting, fussing about things. He says, pray and believe and let me handle it. And you back out and walk with me. And as you're walking with me, believing with me, believe that I came from heaven to earth to solve the whole world's problems. And if I solve death, then I could solve this for you. He has solved man's biggest problem, death and separation from him forever. If he solved that, I trust him to solve this other little thing and that other little thing. And because I trust him, and give it to him, he gives me and you a peace that passes the understanding of the world. Your friends can't figure out why you're walking with peace in the middle of this trial. The world can't figure out why you have this peace in the middle of a struggle. Why? Because you're walking with the creator and he gives you a supernatural peace and it'll guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus who rose from the dead. Can you receive that right now? Hallelujah. I just want to, first of all, take the moment to minister that to you right now. He's here. In the name of Jesus. You need to close your eyes. Go ahead. If you need to lift your hands, go ahead. In the name of Jesus, I speak for anyone's problems of anxiety or struggle with whatever they're going through in this place. You're the risen Lord. You're in me now. And you're speaking Along with everyone here, I speak the peace of God that passes understanding that will guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It's like taking a breath of fresh air, huh? Amen. Welcome. <laughs> we got lots of folks coming from all different directions. <laughs> it's a good thing. Praise the Lord. Let's move on just a bit. Glory to God. All the way back in Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 7, it says of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. God's increase, He's continually increasing His government and peace. I'm telling you, we're a part of something that's bigger than just a local church. It's spreading around the world. Now let's go to the story from the scriptures about the resurrection, praise God. Luke chapter 23, something I just heard this morning I wanted to point out. Faye and I have been doing a little, you know, where the Bible app gives you some a reading for each day during a Bible plan. We did one for Easter, the Holy Week, and uh, read another one this morning and as part of the message, because I'm right here in Luke 24 anyway, I want to back up to chapter 23 and verse 50. So go there and follow with me. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. You know, again, I told you, you have to read all four accounts to get the full picture. 
if you come up in church, you know this man as Joseph of Arimathea. And we know Joseph of Arimathea went to secure and requested to get the body down. They didn't want to leave him there. He wanted to take care of that. But if you read this account, it says he was a member of the council. So just to add that to your understanding, and praise God, another gospel, hallelujah, you know, it says it also, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see the whole picture, Joseph and, uh, and of Arimathea and Nicodemus. So I'm just pointing out that these were leaders of the group that voted to get him crucified. And Joseph of Arimathea was one of the members of the council in Jerusalem. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, 70 leaders over Israel, some Pharisees, some Sadducees, and he was one of them. And he was studying the word and he had a heart longing for the true Messiah. And when he started seeing what was happening on the earth in Jesus healing the sick and fulfilling prophecies, he had enough wisdom and insight by the Holy Ghost to recognize the prophecies he knew all his life that he taught was being fulfilled at this man and he must be the Messiah. So one of the leaders of the council, he didn't consent to their vote. And Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees who secretly came to Jesus by night because he was afraid of what the leaders would say because he was one of them. He also was with Joseph of Arimathea when they took the body down. Why? Because they were now believers. You see, even a lot of the Jews that were you know, the leaders were wanting to crucify him. A lot of them in the council and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they believed also. I'm telling you, on that Passover feast, as I said last week, when hundreds of thousands of people were in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and they were all talking about this Jesus who is healing the sick, it was a big deal. And some were saying, could he be the Messiah? Oh, you know, no one great comes from Nazareth. Oh, they had this thought and the world was divided over him like it is today. You made a conscious decision to get up this morning and to come here and celebrate the resurrection because there's something more about it to you than what the world thinks. You see, where the rubber meets the road, it all comes down to not that he died, but did he rise from the grave? Corinthians says it this way. If Jesus didn't rise, then your faith is futile and we need to just shut down all the churches. But why are we here today? Why did people from this local community put their funds and talents together and ask God to help and build this church and reach out and start a program for those struggling with addiction to go to different nations? Why are we still doing this along with many other people that churches all over this parish? Why is he so famous? Why is he? Tell you about how famous he is. You know, the world's trying to reverse what God did before Christ B.C., and now they want to say BCE, and that's what they're teaching in schools. Well, it's not true. It's BC, before and after Christ. God did that. He made sure that we separated time in half before his son came and after. Amen? Hallelujah. That's what the real, that's what the real deal is. They're, trying, they're teaching your kids in school, even locally around here, something different. But the truth is, Jesus came. There's never been another leader in the world that has split time in half. I asked the guys, what year is it today? 2023. 2023 years since what? Since Jesus. Not Alexander the Great. Not Julius Caesar. Not Nebuchadnezzar. You know? Not Brett Farr. Michael Jordan. Michael Jackson. Nobody has split time in half except for this one dude named Jesus. And churches all around the world are filled up right now. He's the most famous person that ever lived. And that's a fact, Jack, even if you're an atheist. Even if you're an atheist, if you look into it historically, you'll see he's the most famous person that ever lived. This book, 
This Bible we preach out of every week. This is the number one bestseller of all time. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Of all time, still, by far. It's related to more languages than any other book. Hallelujah. Number one, he's the most quoted person that ever lived. Even the atheists have to recognize that. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the golden rule. It's quoted not only in Christian books, it's quoted in philosophy, it's quoted in everything else. He's more quoted than Plato, Socrates, or Shakespeare, or anyone else. There's something about this man looking into and studying and seeing and coming and learn about. But I believe you are here because you already sought him out and you believe where the rubber meets the road is did he rise from the grave? If he didn't rise, then he's just a good dude who made some good quotes and talked about love, started another religion. And we got many of those. But if he rose from the grave, then it's all true. And he's the son of the living God. I challenge you. We have guests in here. Maybe some that aren't regularly in church. I thank you all for inviting them and bringing people in and stuff. And different family members are together. But I challenge you to seek this for yourself. There was a, a journalist out of the Chicago Tribune who was an atheist. His wife got saved, started going to church all the time, kept bugging him about going to church. He hated the idea, wouldn't go. He thought he'd use his journalistic skills to prove to her and to the world that this is just a hoax, it's not true. And praise God, he used his journalistic skills. A scholar, very gifted man, went into archaeology, went into studying history, went into reading, and the deeper he got, the more interested he saw that this is real. And he's got re there's, there's proof and evidence that Jesus rose from the grave. Hallelujah. And he turned and became a Christian. Where the, the evidence, the proof, the rubber meets the road is did he rise? But church, let me ask you, if he rose from the grave and he is who he says he is, because if he didn't, he's a liar. Okay. He can't be both. He can't be a liar and the Savior. He said he's the Son of God. He said he came to take away the sins of the world. He said there's no other way but through him. He's either the truth or a lie. And we need to look into it. And you need to decide for yourself. It's not enough to believe because your grandma did. It's not enough to be Catholic because that's how your family was. It's not enough to be Baptist because it's time as a grown man, a grown woman to decide for yourself once and for all by reading and studying and looking to it and asking God, show me if you seek, you will find. And if you don't seek, you will not find. But if, you, if your heart's drawn to seek, and you begin to learn and grow in Him, and God begins to reveal who He really is, then we, church, we've come to a conclusion that it's true. And if Jesus took away the sin of the world for those who believe, He died and He rose again, then man, I don't want to just kind of check off my name as joined a religion. I don't want to just say, okay, I kind of believe and... I'll welcome him as my savior. I want him to save me from hell one day. No, if he's real, then I believe he's worthy to follow. If he really rose from the grave, then he's the creator of the universe who became a man. Now he knows more about marriage than I do, so I'm going to ask him how to deal with it. He knows more about governments than we do. Let's ask him how to run it. He knows more about life than if he's the Savior and he died and he rose, then it's not enough to say, well, Jesus, I want you to save me at the end so I don't go to hell. Wouldn't he be worth following? Wouldn't he be worth our time and an effort to come in and hear and more? If he really rose, then don't I want to know everything he said? Think about it. Don't I want to hear from other teachers and leaders that God has gifted 
to help bring out the scriptures? Don't I want to meet together with other believers so we can sharpen each other and grow each other and pray for each other's needs and help one another? If he really rose from the dead, church, I think he's worthy to be not only your savior, but also the Lord of your life. Think about it. Maybe some of you here, you've kind of, I mean, we grew up in the South, most of us around here. Everybody's kind of a believer. It's against culture down here, you know, to be against God. Or you ask, I ask most people in the street or say, hello, you believe? Yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus, you know. You go other places in our country, it's not like that, church. A lot of our country and cities have turned far away from God. Maybe you have some sort of insight that you believe in the Savior, but maybe he hasn't really been Lord of your last week. Was he Lord of your life yesterday? In all your ways, do you acknowledge him? Do you acknowledge him before you buy a car? Do you acknowledge him before you click things on your phone? Do you acknowledge him before you decide what movie you're going to watch with your family? Do you acknowledge him in all your ways so he'll direct your paths? Or do you make the decision that Adam did and Eve did? God, we don't want your tree of life to follow you. We want to choose our own knowledge of good and evil and go our own way. Well, as I like to say to the world, how's that working for you? I think most of us have come to the conclusion way for many years. Lord, now I bow my knee to your way. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. If you exalt yourself, you'll be obeyed. If you humble yourself, he will lift you up and you'll follow him. Praise the Lord. You know, I got away from Luke a little bit. We know the story. As Christians, he died on the cross. On the third day, he rose again. Church, the reason we're here and the reason churches are full all around the planet right now is because the truth of the matter is he really did rise. And it changed everything. Changed everything. It changed governments. It changed the world. The world was upside down. He turned it right side up for those who want to walk that way. But he doesn't force anyone. I like to share this part of the story. My members here know where I'm about to go. You know, go with me to Matthew. My wife said, don't keep you all too long today. Go to Matthew 27. So I'll skip a few notes and go right here. I might have said enough. Matthew 27. Let's back up to verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. You know, we have a famous message we like to teach here and teach it to pastors. We know what he said in that loud voice. He cried out, and we'll say it in the Greek because that's the way they wrote it, but he had a sign on top that said, King of the Jews. Man, the Jews' leaders were really mad that Pilate allowed the Romans to put that on there because it was saying the truth. He is the King of the Jews. They didn't want that sign up there. But he cried out in a loud voice, to Telestai, which they wrote in the Greek, which means it is finished. Everything you need to be saved was finished on the cross. Everything to reconcile the world to God was finished on the cross. Every old covenant law was fulfilled, and he fulfilled the law, praise God, by living the perfect life and he fulfilled the curse of the law by becoming the curse on the cross. He finished it all and cried out 
It is finished. You know, in my life, I like to say it this way, church, and I teach it to our people. We're trusting in the finished work of Christ. It's not a work I have to finish. I'm not trying to finish out so I can be saved or be right with God. He finished it all, and I'm right with God based on His finished work. Amen? Hallelujah. That's good to pray. I'm on His finished work. So I know I'm right with God, but none of my righteousness has come from my works. It's all come from his finished work. Let's see what it says next, church. At that moment, this is amazing. It's not preached very, very often. I don't know why I preach it every year now. I rarely, I, I didn't hear this coming up. And once I saw it, it kind of shook me and took me and I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I'm never the same. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Think of this as the temple in Jerusalem that all the Pharisees and Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection, that's why they were sad, you see. (laughs) They, you know, voted to have him crucified. And there they were, you know, worshiping God in a way they couldn't understand the truth. And yet, behind that big curtain was where they would meet with the presence of God and the high priest coming in once a year. And no one could go in. Only the high priest once a year. But the Bible says when Jesus took the sin of the world and paid for all, and it was finished, God ripped the temple. That's why it ripped the the curtain from top to bottom. That's why it says from top. Man didn't rip it from the bottom. It's a big temple with a big curtain several layers, he ripped it from the top and opened it up, symbolizing church that the way into the presence of God has now been finished. Jesus is the veil of the temple, the door by believing we go into the presence of God. So that happened, glory to God. Then the veil of the temple was ripped, the earth shook and the rocks split. You know, some used to say all the rocks of the world split. That's why whenever you find a rock, it always has a split in it. I don't know. Makes a good story. But the rocks split. Okay, I don't know how many. Then it says this. Look at verse 52. Here's the one that's rarely preached. You might have never heard it if you hadn't been here in Easter. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died, were raised to life. I love that. Jesus was the only one that rose. The bodies of many holy people, praise God, that believed in God, followed God, that were buried outside of Jerusalem. They used to bury people, let their bodies rot, and then have a second ceremony where they'd collect the bones and put it in a little box and put it in a cave because there wasn't enough room to have burial like we got all over the place. They were putting them in caves, put many of those ossuaries of little boxes all around. The Bible says, when he cried, praise the Lord, to tell us die, the rock split, the veil of the temple was ripped open, and the tombs broke open, and many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, because he's the first to rise, the rock split, praise God. After Jesus, re- see, Jesus' resurrection was so powerful, it sucked those holy people right out of the grave too. Jesus' resurrection was so powerful, it sucked me from death to life. It brought me out of death into his marvelous light. Just, man, I'm, I'm there now. Hallelujah. I'm walking in eternal life right now. It's a joy. Then it says this. Verse 53, and I'm closing. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, what did they do? Some of you got your Bible open, some of you don't know yet. They didn't put it up there. You might know what happened. They went into the holy city, and they appeared to many people. Where would you go? If you were believing for the Messiah died in the Old Testament, was buried outside of Jerusalem, 
and Jesus, there was an earthquake and you heard the voice of God and you rose and you went into the city, where would you go? I know where I'd go. It looked something like this. When I knock on this door, y'all say, come in. Hi, honey. I'm home. I'm back. About it. Jesus rose from the grave. There was an earthquake. The veil was split. And many who were dead and buried rose from the grave. And they went somewhere. They went into the holy city. And what they do? They appeared. Not I'd appear to my wife. Then I'd appear to some others. You know what I'd do? I'd keep on appearing. So God told me what to do next. You know, listen, so why are we here today? Why are churches full all around the world? Because he really did rise. And it created no small stir in Jerusalem that all these people rose and Jesus appeared to Mary. Then he appeared to the disciples. Then he appeared to 500. He appeared over a period of 40 days. Did they appear over a period of 40 days too? And then when he ascended, did they ascend too? I don't know. Did they stay living again like Lazarus until they died again? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But it tells us many rose and appeared to many. And I believe it. You know why? Because look at all the folks that are still believing today. It created no small stir, so much so that Rome tried to crush it. They threw Christians to the, to the lions. They destroyed the temple. The devil's been trying to stop the church ever since, but the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus is alive. He's resurrected. He lives in me, and he lives in all the believers here. If maybe he's been your savior Maybe you believe in him somewhat in your past because you're from the South, but he hasn't been Lord of your life. I ask you to consider today making him Lord of tonight when you go home and tomorrow when you wake up and follow him.